This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Luis Mojica. Luis is a somatic therapist and educator and founder of Holistic Life Navigation. In 2020, I was struggling with feelings of grief, loss, and pain, and looking for tools to help myself, and my path led me to Luis. His teachings on how to find safety and joy in our bodies through movement, sensation, mindfulness, and nutrition was life-changing and deeply inspired from his own personal healing journey. I'm thrilled to bring you this insightful, powerful episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. Hi, Luis. I love you now, Paula. Thank you. I love you. You watch it. <laughs> um, mm. It's really hard for me to introduce you without getting emotional. Mm. Because I found you in 2020, in August 2020, when the explosion in Beirut happened. Mm. And I was going through so many emotions and... I was just really struggling both mentally and emotionally to find tools and ways to feel safe in my body. And I even remember looking at my partner and saying, I'm saying this out loud, I'm not gonna have a drink for the next six months and I'm gonna find tools to move through what everything I'm feeling in healthier ways. And you appeared. <laughs> I don't know how you appeared, but you appeared. And I remember taking that six-week course with you and how profound it was for me. And I'm just so honored to have you here so mm. other people can learn from you as well. You appeared and I found your, your talk. Oh. Well, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And I was just so, I thought, oh, this person's in my course. This is amazing. <laughs> and I really wanted to get to know you more because there was so much wisdom there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So before we kind of dig into everything that you do, can you tell us a little bit about how you grew up? And where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a, it's like a sideshow story. <laughs> Let me do my best. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe in relationship to what you do and, and how it connects into what you do. Mm. I, I guess I always say that I grew up in um, such a situation that was extremely ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. I had an ethnically ambiguous family. I had a biologically ambiguous body, and my mind was very ambiguous. So there wasn't like a square mm -hmm. I could fit into, or I could fit my family into, or I could fit any idea you mm -hmm. know, of identity into. And that would originally be, I think, some of the source of my greatest pain in childhood. Mm -hmm but would turn out to be this incredible gift of being able to show up to each situa a situation with lots of curiosity. So how, maybe tell us just in relationship to your body, what did not feel safe yeah. growing up? You don't really notice something's different about you until someone tells you mm -hmm. when you're young, because mm -hmm. it's the only thing you ever knew. And for me, I was born into a body that's classified as intersex. There's many different classifications of it, the one I fall into is called the hormonal expression. Mm. So my body was flooded with estrogen from birth mm. until 15 years old. So the first 15 years of my life, I was estrogen dominant. So my hormones mimicked that of like a young girl. So my body was having these weird shape shifts, you know, because some parts of me looked very male, other parts of me looked very female. And those other parts in particular were the development of breast tissue and hips and then actual breasts during puberty. So I had this kind of double puberty, like these mm. things were happening that would make me male. These things were happening that made me feel female. Mm. And it was just the body I had. I didn't think much of it until toward the end of fifth grade when the other boys started going through their puberty as well. Just started noticing there's something different about how their bodies look. Mm something different about their mind, just something different about just how they even feel settled in themselves. They don't mm -hmm. really have to question it. And like I was saying earlier, so many different ambiguous identities that I was part of and born into, the, the physical one was probably the most intense because I carried it everywhere I went. And so as, as it became known in school, particularly sixth grade, and that's when I remember it really starting, 
it became known amongst my male peers that there was something different about my body. My female peers I had such a kinship with. Mm. Like when you were describing your experience, mm. I felt like, yeah, that was mine too. Mm. So we really got each other and I felt safe with them. I had all, all my friends were girls, mm. but the male peers started seeing me more as like an object mm. and especially started seeing me as something that was other from them. And they really wanted me to know that. So it was lots of intense bullying and sexual assault and violations and harassment would ensue for years after mm. that. And the story that that told me, like the the, story, the meaning I made up as a 11 year old mm. was that there's something wrong with me, that I was deformed, I was disfigured, that I would just never kind of be part of that. Not even the club of boys, but like the club of human. Mm. I, I felt so not human. So I did the only thing we do when it's too much pain, I found a way to not feel anymore. And for me, it was dissociation, so numbing out and losing my body and eating lots of food, lots and lots of food, just to quell all the sensations that were there. How did all those things that were happening to you, happening to you affect the relationship to your body? My experience with my body for a very long time, until recently, was betrayal. Mm. So the relationship felt like this thing is betraying me, mm. and I don't know what I did, mm. don't know why, I don't know how to fix that or help that. Mm. So the relationship was one of real self-hatred, like, like utter, utter, utter self-hatred, um, to the extent of not wanting to be in one anymore. You know, I fantasized about so many ways of leaving this body and almost attempted it on a couple of occasions, but something would pull me back or someone would walk in, something would kind of interrupt that ability to go even deeper into a pain, mm. which, you know, thankfully. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't see this body as a being. I didn't see this body as anything beautiful or anything to offer the world. I just saw it as this horrible burden that betrayed mm. me and I felt like at odds with it. Mm. What activated your healing journey? <laughs> two things. <laughs> I mean, 202 things. <laughs> the two things are really kind of shifted things mm -hmm. from like suicide and yes. wanting to commit suicide to actually loving being in a body. The first was nature. Mm -hmm. I think I was 13. And I had discovered this book on Wicca and it was particularly like the indigenous customs of the Celtic people, which is part of my lineage, one side of the family. And I went into that book and I found these photos and these descriptions of deities that were hermaphrodites, mm -hmm. which like is like a bad word nowadays, but I'm fine with it. And it was just this beautiful depiction of these other than human creatures that had all these different parts. Some mm -hmm. had animal parts, some had tree parts. I thought, wow, there's a place that exists in the world, you know, whether it's in the mind or in like you know, a lineage, where something other than a standard human form um, is sacred. Mm -hmm. It was the first moment that I had an invitation to see my body as something sacred too. And that was huge. And I remember just walking outside up to the forest and looking at the trees and seeing all these interesting things in them that I hated in my own body, mm -hmm. but seeing how beautiful they were on the trees. I had cystic acne at the time, so I had all these big, you know, explosive boils all over my face and my back and my chest. And I'm seeing these trees, these really big knots that I thought were beautiful. It's like, why is that beautiful? But this mm. is ugly. So I started having this amazing shift of I'm not of this planet to I'm just as natural as these trees are. Oh. And that was, the, that was a really big door that opened up. Oh, I love that. That was the one thing. Do you want yeah. the second thing? The second, okay. yes. <laughs> so that was the first one that really kind of sang me back to my body. And the second one literally sang me back to my body. It was music. Mm. I was watching a documentary, a Joni Mitchell documentary of all things. And I, I had this sudden urge to play a guitar. And I had bought a guitar on eBay. I was a dishwasher and I, I used like 40 bucks and bought a guitar on eBay and hung it on my wall. Um, just kind of like the way it looked. I knew nothing about music, no interest in playing. Wow. And so I walked to my room and I started strumming it. And I didn't realize until two years ago what happened in that moment, but the, the hollowed body of the guitar was right across my breasts and my belly and my hips, which were the most dysphoric places for me. And this vibration as I was playing the guitar was vibrating into those places. And being vibrational, it wasn't human, it wasn't even animal, it was like something else. 
but the vibration sung those places back to life. Like mm. I could feel sensation yeah. in places that were numb. And that's really the seed of my work that, that got planted when I was 16 and, and didn't even understand it for, you know, almost two decades after. What are some other healing modalities that have helped you on your healing journey? Two things that I really love. One is the work of Byron Katie, mm. which is this uh, form of self-inquiry where you find a statement, something like, um, like, my mother hates me, mm. and you question the statement, and then there's these turnarounds, and this is the part I'm going to highlight. These turnarounds are these moments where you find three different opposites that are true, not just an affirmation, but something that's true. So like, my mother hates me. Opposite, I hate my mother. Mm. Opposite, my mother loves me. Mm. Opposite, I hate myself. Like, you just go into as many mm. opposites as you can imagine. And what I've experienced from doing this is it kind of pulls the ego, it stretches it. So you're not super certain mm. because the somatic experience of certainty is constriction. So if mm. I know something, this is what happens, especially about a person, especially when it's stressful about a person, mm. right? If I know that you're wonderful, because the hot feels good. Mm. But if I know you don't like me, there's a constriction that comes in there. So just going to the turnarounds, I kind of like take a shortcut and just mm. go into those right away. It's so fun just to notice my own resistance to something being less painful. Like, maybe she doesn't hate me all the time. <laughs> like, can my body handle that? You know, sometimes it can. It really wants her to hate me all the time. But then I notice, well, there was that one time. And this isn't true for me. My mother loves me. I'm just, I'm just using this right yeah. now. But this this segues into a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Carolyn Elliott, a practice called Existential Kink. And it's it's kind of similar, but it, it uses a lot of pendulation that we talked about earlier where you notice a pattern or something in your life you just hate. You're like, I hate this, this is horrible, this feels really bad. And you, what she calls it, is an existential kink. So part of you is getting off on hating this thing. Mm. And it's not like a recipe for bypassing or allowing harm at all. It, it's the total opposite because the trauma becomes vitality. So if I hate um, being in these relationships with people that are never available, mm. right? Like it's patterns always happening. What, what do I love about their unavailability? Like, what do I love about rejection? What do, I, what do I love about being alone in a room? What do I love about like fearing where they are, what they're doing? If I can get in touch with those parts, just like with pendulation, I feel another landscape in my body open up, right? Like another opportunity, another option. Mm. And this agency moves through. So I'm not just like, oh, this is horrible. But I go into this like, some part of me is just loving this right now and it <laughs> transmutes the energy. Wow. So between the work of Byron Katie and Existential Kink, those are, are some of my favorite practices. Wow. Yeah. I but the that. somatics is always they're the, always the foundation of these things. Huh. That's cool. Is there any um, anything that's uh, that you've tried on this healing journey that's maybe um, lesser known or a little more fringe or beans beans <laughs> beans are pretty good for you i think beans are the most shockingly the most <laughs> most controversial thing why is that are fucking beans why i have no idea whenever i talk about beans publicly <laughs> I get so much hate mail. <laughs> really? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. And it, it's the simplest thing ever is these extremely affordable, accessible creatures. <laughs> <laughs> Little beans. Anyone get them anywhere. They're super cheap. And it's one of the most effective foods at clearing adrenaline from your gut. And your gut recycles adrenaline. So if you have any chronic inflammation, if you have PTSD, if you have chronic stress in your life, if you're trying to heal trauma, you need something that's going to remove that adrenaline because yeah. it's it's a closed circuit. It just keeps being introduced back into the bloodstream. But beans literally whisk it out huh. every time you have a bowel movement. So if you have three half cup servings a day, it's been there's a biochemist I work with. She's studied this for 40 years. She consistently sees blood adrenaline levels dropping. Wow. And people, I mean, healing all sorts of things, but especially PTSD. Wow. Uh, so I think it's super fringe, actually, yeah. just from the response I get, because you don't think of food when you think mm. of trauma healing. Mm. And a big part of my work is teaching people what foods stimulate adrenaline, which foods don't. Mm. And 
PTSD is an adrenal issue. It's yeah. it's a the adrenals consistently stimulating themselves to make more adrenaline, which creates fight or flight. Yeah. So if you learn what foods actually activate your adrenal glands, you're you're literally learning, okay, what turns all my stress response, what slows it down. And that's what you want to learn. Because yeah. if you're already stressed and you already have stress in your life, you don't want to put more fire. You want to on add it. to fire, yeah. yeah. So the beans are the most fringe. Huh. And the most effective from what I've seen. It's amazing. Cause, you know, Lebanese cuisine has so many beans uh, in it. Puerto Rican. Yeah. yeah, totally. <laughs> so for me, it's like, no, that's just part of, like, my food. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's so interesting. So Strange. maybe let's get into that. Like, what 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 does activate trauma and what does is what heals it? You foods. Know? Yeah, what foods. Yeah. So I put them into three different categories. The stimulants the depressants and the balancers. Mm. Stimulants are things like coffee, any kind of caffeine, lots of sugar, skipping meals. That's just like some mm. of the stimulants. The depressants are really heavy foods. These are foods that take a lot of energy to digest. Mm. It's like pizza, pasta, fried food, lots of nutrient dense things, right? Then you have the balancers. These are the whole foods that are unrefined, really simple, tend to be bland. They can be, I mean, delicious when they're spiced, but comparatively, <laughs> mm. they tend to be bland and less exciting. But these balancing foods, they nourish your adrenal glands, they repair your nervous system, they balance your blood sugar levels. Those things being nourished and balanced will keep you from going into fight or flight response. Mm. It would make it a little more difficult, unless you're in a real-time threat. They won't create that in your body. Whereas the stimulus and the depressants, they will create an imbalance. You know, actually have an adrenal response to eating those foods. So everything in your life could be amazing, and you eat something, mm. and 30 minutes later, you're having a stress response because of the food you ate. Mm. And I found this fascinating when I was in private practice because I would have people coming in week after week doing trauma work. Their life would be changing. Their life would, was getting better. They let's say they had money or they had a good relationship or they liked their body yet they still had insomnia, they still had PTSD symptoms. And I started asking them, like, what do you drink in the morning? Oh, I mm. have three cups of coffee. And all the people with the PTSD would have a lot of activators in their diets. Oh, and so when I started taking those out, because I started as a nutritionist, when I took those out, then we started noticing huge shifts in their nervous system and their, their wow. sleeping habits and such. So what are the balancers aside from beans? <laughs> yeah, so um, any vegetable, um, whole fruits that are in season, mm. grains, and four ounces or less of animal protein with a meal. Mm. Anything over four ounces can actually create an adrenaline response. Mm. So it's it's really simple, super mm. simple. How has your healing journey affected um, how you help others heal? Um, I just truly understand it. It's not... Um, Healing for me is so nonlinear, right? So it's not just about like, do this, do this, do this, mm -hmm. you should be fixed. I don't believe in fixing. No, there's no fixing. Yeah, there's no end, end point. There's no end. And, <laughs> I, and I come from that understanding, you know, and I, I just think when you, when you so viscerally are steeped in that kind of suffering for a long time, you don't forget that. Like it, it's in my bones, it's, it's from where I teach. So when I see somebody else who's suffering or someone going through pain or someone hating themselves, I don't even see them as a victim. I just get it. Mm. Like I get where that comes from. Yeah. So I would say it just informs my ability to truly connect beyond empathy. Just say yeah, I connect from the place of shared experience. Yeah. yeah. So what is the somatic therapy? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the seeds were planted. Yeah. I mean, my way of talking about somatic therapy and, and teaching it and experiencing it is creating a relationship with your body. It's literally as simple as, I'm not my body, I'm this conscious energy, I'm this witnesser of a body. And the somatic work helps me actually experience that. So it's not just a concept that someone's saying, that sounds interesting, mm. but it's an experience of, my hand's doing this while I'm talking to Mira, I'm not telling you to do that. What's, mm. the, ooh, what's this animal doing? <laughs> and, and this big curiosity. So it's really the somatic therapy for me is an invitation to create a relationship with the body rather than identify with the body. And that changes everything because like me, lots of people identify with their traumatic events. So their abuse, the war, whatever they experience, they think that's who they are. It's like, no, it happened to my body. It's not, has nothing mm. to do, actually do with me. It's not mine. 
So when you go into that understanding of I'm not my body, all the things that happen to your body also aren't yours. And that's extremely liberating. Maybe we should go into trauma. Like what is mm. trauma? And let's just start there. What is trauma? Mm -hmm. Trauma is any situation or event that's so big, your body can't metabolize it. And so it disconnects. So it's something that creates such a life force in the body. It can mm. be watching a scary movie when you're three, mm. it can be being in war, it can be assault. There's so many different things. We, we used to think we could categorize it based on the experience. And then we realized, well, some people, both people were in war, one person has PTSD, one doesn't. So mm -hmm. what, what's happening here? And what we all learned in the last few decades is that each body has a capacity to metabolize sensation. When something really big happens, it makes a lot of sensation. And if you can metabolize that, it's a stressful event that gets metabolized, it gets um, digested. When you can't metabolize that, when you lack the capacity for whatever reason in that moment, it's a traumatic event. It goes from stress to trauma and it, it means it gets stored in you. Mm. So what your body wanted to do, how it wanted to scream, how it wanted to run, it gets packaged and compressed and lives in your bones now. And then you live from that compression. So it, it becomes your state, mm -hmm. something that should have been temporary, like a scream becomes your, your posture for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, but the easiest way to say that is just, it's an event that's too much for your body to process, so it has to disconnect. Mm. What's that difference? Like what, what, what is, what's this, what's, is there something that like mm -hmm. makes it um, either digestible or not digestible? So the short answer is capacity. <laughs> <laughs> the long answer is so much influences your capacity. So capacity is just, it's a biology, first of all, it's not a mindset. It's how the body actually has, it's the ability of the body to metabolize the stressful experience. So that means the neurotransmission in the nervous system, the nerve cells themselves. This means the stress hormones in the bloodstream that the liver digests. This means your muscles releasing and your breath getting deeper and your blood oxygen going up. Mm -hmm. Like this whole series of events have to occur for your body to realize the threat's gone, I survived. Mm -hmm. In that place of I survived, trauma doesn't happen. When the animal body is expecting more threats, it doesn't know it survived. That's when we're traumatized. Mm -hmm. So, so many things add to that, but the one most primary is connection mm -hmm. to others, to mm -hmm. land, not even people, but animals, land, ocean, beings. When you have a connection during or shortly after a traumatic event, you're, you're less likely to get traumatized from mm -hmm. it because you have more capacity because someone is connecting to your body and it keeps you connected to yourself. It anchors you in that place. Yeah. Without that external connection, the internal sensations get so big, you have to disconnect from your body. Then there's nothing around you to anchor you to the space. So you're just kind of floating outside yourself. Ugh. And that's what the, one of the largest contributions of someone developing PTSD versus someone not mm. is their connections. Yeah. Yeah, I attribute my feeling safe in the world to my mother. Yeah. Yeah, because she was there to kind of co-regulate with. That's why your story was so important to me, mm -hmm. because I've studied and learned about people like you who've been in those situations, and it was really nice to have someone to share, yeah, I'm that person. I yeah. had this safety, so it didn't traumatize me. Yeah. You said we think we have to heal our trauma, but really all we have to do is witness it. What does that mean? I mean, that's, I'm so glad you're bringing that in because that's a huge, huge part of my experiences. And when I see people feel so freed mm. when I bring that to them and they learn to do that, like the burden of healing it is gone because mm. the body processes all this. There's not a person out there like healing their trauma. We, we say that but the body's doing that. Um, think about earlier, I was saying how when something traumatic happens, what makes it traumatic is the disconnect, right? And often it's because there's no other relationship around us. We're alone in it. Mm -hmm. When that person is there, when that like compassionate witness is across from you in the room, mm -hmm while it's happening inside of you or outside of you. Someone's anchoring you to your experience because they're witnessing, they're with you. Someone they say like withness instead of witness. Mm -hmm. And it's really what it is. It's like you're with the experience with the other person. So when you learn how to witness your own, your own sensations, where you store things, memories, experiences, you become that compassionate witness to mm -hmm. this place in the body. And then it starts unfolding. Because in that moment, self-regulation 
is co-regulation between your mind and your body. So mm -hmm. these two beings are seeing each other and being seen. And in that, there's just this sense of anchored, right? I, again, I belong. Mm -hmm. I'm here because you're seeing me. I exist. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're looking for someone outside of you to give you something to heal this inside of you. And it just won't happen. You have to learn how to witness those parts that you want other people to be able to witness. Can they sometimes? Absolutely, and that's excellent. But we want to do the work for when there isn't someone that can, mm -hmm. or we're alone, how do we hold that for ourselves? Mm -hmm. How is somatic therapy different than talk therapy? Oof, huge. Um, I want to make sure when I say different, I don't want to say better. So it can be a snob. <laughs> um, no, it's, 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 really not, it's really not better. Um, it's wildly different. Talk therapy really helps you build your story. It really helps you identify what happened. It gives you kind of parameters of the situation. Mm. Somatic therapy gives you the felt sense of what happened. So the easiest thing is talk therapy helps me identify the experience. Somatic therapy helps me feel the experience. Where does it live in my bones still? How am I carrying it around today? If I'm just orienting to the story of it in the past, I'm still not feeling how the past lives in me now. Mm. So there's nothing to directly connect to and work with. Mm. So that's the, that's the biggest difference. You, I, I remember being in a retreat with you and you talking about how uh, the mind and the body are kind of these two things mm. that are um, pretty separate. Mm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship there between the mind and the body and how they're similar or different? Yeah, the, the mind really shows up in the body, but they're not necessarily the same thing for me. Mm. When I think of the mind, I think of the witnesser. So I'm looking at you right now. I hear myself saying, I'm looking at you right now. Mm -hmm. It's my mind witnessing all this. Mm -hmm. My body is what's sitting in the room. And they're, they're two different creatures. So my body sensationally experiences life. It moves, it walks places, it hits tables, it runs up against walls. The mind is limitless. It can travel anywhere. You can think of an image and go there. There's no rules. It's very etheric. So it has this ability when we're mind focused, like when we're mindful, interestingly enough, we lose the body mm. because we're so focused on what the mind wants mm. and we're not noticing how that's impacting the body. So I'm interested in them as like a, as a symbiotic relationship. Where does my mind go? Okay, and how's my body feel where my mind goes? And letting them communicate with each other so they can be um, a more equal field. Yeah, I remember you saying that when the mind, when we get too much into our stories, we're just getting, I remember even you picking up like a pillow and saying, you know, this is your body and you throwing it across <laughs> yeah. the room and saying, that's where your body is right now. Just mm -hmm. how the more in our stories we are, the less in our bodies we are. And that's what really propelled me into somatic work because I had this interesting experience that awakened all these memories that I had completely forgotten and repressed. Mm -hmm. So I went to therapy for years for it and my symptoms were getting worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And I learned through those experiences that I was talking about them so much and identifying the experiences so much that here is my body in the room with the therapist, but I was so far from my body with the story. The story was orienting me 20 years ago when it happened. I wasn't even able to feel the room I was in. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty profound to notice the more I identify with what happened, the less I even feel this body right now. And that in itself becomes a tactic to not have to feel. Yeah. You talk about relating to the body and understanding the body and how they're on different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit what relating and then understanding? Yeah, I would say relating is so somatic. And it's, it's uh, curious, mm. right? I'm just with what's happening right now and I'm kind of watching to see what happens next. Maybe I'm tending to it, maybe I'm putting my hand on my shoulder, you know, I'm kind of like with what's happening. Understanding is I'm trying to figure it out and trying to know why, trying to get the meaning. Both are great, but they're, they're, they're largely different. What's really beautiful with somatic work is I don't have to even understand my body anymore. Mm. I can just relate to what's happening so I can have a sensation of a panic attack. I don't have to know why or what or where it's going. If I just relate to that panic attack as it's coming through me, it usually starts to subside without having to you know, know the roots of it or where it comes from. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, what are the warning signs that our behavior or lifestyle might be stemming from past trauma? Mm. 
my mind's like, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> trying to feel into that one more. Yeah, I would say the things that you do unconsciously and don't like. Hmm. So the things you say you don't want to do anymore, but they keep happening. Or the things you do, and you're like, why did I do that? There's something else moving through you. And I, I see the body as the subconscious. And I think it's interesting because the term itself, subconscious, is under, mm -hmm. it's beneath what we know. Mm -hmm. we, we tend to know from up here. So I think all this stuff from the neck down um, is the, where the subconscious lies and rests. And in that kind of ocean, yeah. there's so much information. So when I'm addicted to something, let's say, that's something most people would consciously say they don't want, but they don't know how to stop. Social media Social or media or, or alcohol, whatever it is, right? There's the gamut. This body's moving towards something to try to find some kind of safety. If I'm having a behavioral expression, like I always choose this kind of partner, and I say I'm not going to do this again, and it happens again, my body's choosing that. If my mind was choosing it, if I was consciously doing it, it wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But something in my body keeps moving toward these people or substances or situations that tells you there's some echo of your past that's coming through now and is trying to get a need met, but it, it's confused. Because a traumatized body is actually an extremely confused and overworked body. Mm. It's constantly expecting threat and orienting and trying to figure out what's going to go wrong. So it's confused because it's it's incongruent with where it is. Like we're in this room right now and I could have a ton of panic, which would have nothing to do with being in this room right now, mm. right? And in those incongruencies, my body is showing me I'm, rem I'm remembering something, I'm holding something that isn't in relationship to where I am right now. So that speaks to what you're saying about this past mm. or even the subconscious future that I might be fearing. You're reminding me of this concept called uncoupling that you mm -hmm. talk about. Can yeah. you just briefly, I know it's a big topic, but can you briefly explain that? Because I think it relates to what you just said. Yeah, yeah. So overcouplings is a term where there's a, some kind of guaranteed association with something else. So think of like Pavlov's dog, something being Pavlovian, that's an overcoupling. So if someone yelled at me when they made me oatmeal every morning, and I smell oatmeal. And I have the smell of oatmeal overcoupled with being yelled at. So just the smell of it, my shoulders will start doing this because mm -hmm. my body's expecting threats. So it has said, well, this happened in the past. It's probably going to happen again. It's how the body keeps itself alive. Fire is a really helpful overcoupling. You get burned once, your body now knows that flame burns. So overcouplings are important for survival. But in that oatmeal you know, example, they're, they're not helpful because that was a different situation. Mm -hmm. So uncoupling is to learn what associations does my physical body have with environment, with people, with words, even with things that would trigger memories. And being able to uncouple the two mm -hmm. means I feel myself 36 years old with a bowl of oatmeal. Where does that live in my body? Mm -hmm. I feel myself five years old being yelled at even the oatmeal, where does that live in my body? And I get this awareness of this is the memory, this is what's happening right now. And that right now-ness anchors you into the safety, mm -hmm. then you, you have the capacity to even metabolize these old echoes as they show themselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. Do you think this, you know, being disconnected from the body was prevalent with our ancestors or is it a product of our modern day lifestyles. I love that question. <laughs> love that question because I've been playing with I've been playing with not knowing my ancestors like I think I do. Cuz so many times in a conversation, I'll hear somebody or myself be like, "Well, our ancestors didn't do that." Do how do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. So they could have been like horrible or they could have been amazing. I have no clue. So I've been playing with like, what if I just don't know what they did? Mm. Um but we ha I have a sense, we all have a sense of what they didn't have. Like we know what kind of world they came from, what situations they had. It was a much more tactile world. Uh, I think you were bound to the humility of the laws of nature more. Mm -hmm. And that does something for embodiment. Because mm -hmm. if you're not in this body, you're not gonna be able to navigate the forest or hunt something or build a house with your hands. I think when, if I think of like villages, many bodies being together, so mm -hmm. forming from co-regulation, mm -hmm. nomadic tribes, like um, women raising children in huge groups. So I think like the school of fish, like the mycelial connection mm -hmm. of bodies, that's one thing I'm pretty certain yeah. my ancestors had that we don't have in the same way. I think it's a really important piece of what we're trying to understand in this modern world is like, how do we have connection not be something novel, but something that's just kind of a cultural norm? I'll think for myself why it was such a problem and what I 
witness and other people, um, we don't even know safety's inside. Mm. It's such a um, taught experience, a learned experience, that the safety is outside of me. Like, you're loving me, now I'm safe. Mm. You're saying I belong, now I'm safe, mm. right? Like, this alcohol, this food, this money, whatever it is, health, this, this thing I'm after is what gives me my safety. I think the notion that it lives in us is is still really new and, and unexplored and that we can tend to it and we can do things that kind of remind us of our internal safety and then we go back in and we cultivate that. Mm. So when you learn that the safety is in you, just like the trauma, mm -hmm. the trauma is not what happened 20 years ago, mm -hmm. it's, it's what happened 20 years ago and how it's reverberating in you still. Mm -hmm. The safety isn't in you loving me, the safety is in my chest. When you say, I love you, Luis, and I, Oh, that's happening inside of me. The safety's in me. Mm. So I think just even redirecting people to notice, are you habitually looking outside externally for your safety? Or do you have a practice to feel where it already lives in you and then build on it? I think if we don't even know we can do that, that's why most people struggle because it's not even, uh, it's, it's, it's not even a concept that they're familiar with that you can go inside and feel safe. Yeah. I think that was that was a big kind of unlock for me when I really? took your course, yeah. Just like that practice of starting to just practice feeling safe in my own body. Yeah. Um, was huge. Yeah. I've heard you say being triggered is a reminder. What does that mean? Yeah. So so if I'm triggered, there's two things happening. There's the trigger, the person, the situation, and the triggered, what it brings up in my body. We tend to just orient on the thing that triggered us, right? The person, I'll say person in this case. And the moment I orient to you, if you triggered me, I lost all this. Mm. You're now what I'm orienting toward. But what makes this so painful when I'm triggered is it's reminding me of something. And this is different from a preference. Like I can prefer you not talk to me a certain way. It doesn't mean I'm triggered. Triggered is when your body feels a panic and urgency, like a, like a numbing overwhelm mm. of sensation in response to something that isn't inherently threatening. So you roll your eyes at me and it feels like you slap me in the face. Mm. I'm being triggered. Your eye roll has reminded me of a time I was disrespected in a much bigger way. Mm. So when I understand it as a reminder, I disorient from you, which is actually helpful. And I go into what's it reminding me of? Cause mm. I'm carrying it with me. So even if you, like fix your behavior, someone's gonna roll their eyes again. Mm -hmm. It's never gonna be gone until I actually metabolize it. So seeing them as um, as reminders has been amazing for me. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> like I remember <laughs> hearing that, my, my brain just went <laughs> Yeah. Um, how do we build capacity for safety in the body? I've been playing with these two terms, a build capacity and tend to capacity, because mm -hmm. I've been saying build capacity for the longest time. And then I had this experience where I led a big group of people into the forest to do co-regulation with trees and such. You did that I with did me it, once. Yeah. And this woman went in and she had such horrible knee pain mm. and her body was saying like, don't walk anymore, like lay down. And she's like, but I have to build capacity. And so build capacity became this mm. kind of theme for her. Pushing, yeah, ex enduring. Exactly, so. I have to endure. And I thought, how interesting because that's one of the reasons so many of us don't have capacity for life because we're overly pushing, we're enduring beyond our, our capacity. So I thought, what, what's the reality? What's the thing I'm really trying to teach is tending capacity. Mm -hmm. Learning the signals and the sensations and the symptoms when the body says no, mm -hmm. when the body says I need a break, when the body says I need to close my eyes, like simple little cues. So if I tend to the capacity, what always happens is then it builds. Mm -hmm. So it's like in the pause, it builds. What that means for us is when my capacity builds, it, it simply put, I just have more space in my body. That's all it means. So if something really horrible happens, there's space for a breath. There's space for a stretch. There's space for uh, my adrenals to realize I don't have to make so much adrenaline. Right? There's space for my liver to metabolize the stress hormones. There's more space for the sensation. So if there's more space, there's more capacity. Yeah. And why we wanna build our capacity is when we have more space, we show up to stressful experiences with bodies that have more space. So it doesn't bowl us over. It's less recovery time, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Yeah, I love how when you talk about the body, you talk about 
contraction and expansion, openness and expansion. Mm -hmm. Maybe can you elaborate a little bit about that? How, you know, how we start to like even notice when we go into contraction and when we feel mm. more expansive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if we think of contraction, just even like with our hands, like contraction, expansion, right? Contraction is what the body does to prepare for a threat. So whether it's about to happen, or I'm thinking of public speaking in four months, mm -hmm. right? The body will start to contract, it's getting ready to protect itself. What's interesting about trauma responses, we're talking about trauma, but trauma responses come from the contraction. I pull back to then punch out. Mm -hmm. I pull back to then scream or run or kick, that kind of thing. When we're traumatized, the contraction happens, the expansion doesn't follow. So we're stuck in contraction. So literally my joints, yeah, my face, <laughs> my lungs, things start to just get smaller, less space. And chronically being contracted causes actual you know, health issues. Yeah, and illness, chronic illness, autoimmune issues and such. So contraction is the very physiology of I'm pulling back to prepare for a threat. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't happened yet, or it's a reminder of it, or it's the memory of it. So there's nothing to respond to in real time. So I never get to expand, mm -hmm. right? So expansion is when that finally gets to blossom through me. And instead of walking around like this, I'm walking around like this. Mm -hmm doesn't even mean I'm peaceful, it just means there's space in me. Yeah. So whatever I'm feeling gets to move through. How do we teach our bodies to, to move through our emotions, our feelings? Because I mean, on a daily basis, the world's coming at us, right? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we teach that? I see it, I'm learning, it's more about how do we not get in the way of what it knows? Mm. Because it's, it's more teaching ourselves not to have the reaction to it. So when someone says something, and. I feel like a rage rise up in me. The reaction would be to contract against it usually, to judge it, to be afraid of what's gonna happen, to just reflexively scream. But if I'm in a relationship with that sensation, and it's far more complex than what I'm saying, but there's, there's <laughs> lots of practices and it's a lifestyle to get, to get there. But when you're in a relationship with that, you don't have to teach the body what to do there, you're teaching your mind not to have a contracted response. So maybe you breathe instead, maybe you stretch, maybe you let tears come out. The body just knows how to metabolize these things. It's our secondary responses that just makes more activation and constriction. And then the body's overwhelmed, not by what's even happening in the world, not by the death of someone or the loss of a job or illness, but our response to it. That's what actually overwhelms the body, which is fascinating. Yeah, the body can handle almost anything. Yeah, you, you you mentioned to me once that the body and nature can handle everything. Yeah. Like when you watch nature, I mean, you know, I remember being next to a river and you're talking about a mm. rock being like constantly, mm -hmm. you know, the, the water hitting the rock, hitting the rock, hitting the rock. And I love that analogy. Can you just speak speak on it a little bit? Like, I mean, you said it so well. <laughs> it's exactly that. It's, you know, we watch, what I love about nature is her body's bigger than ours. So there's so much capacity for even holding what we have, but there isn't a lot of like um, restriction in nature. Something happens and there's like a flow with it. Mm. And that's what happens in the body. There's this flow with everything that comes into it, but the judgment of it, the fear of it, creates the contraction mm. we were just talking about, the constriction. And in that, the, the energy can't even move to release itself. Yeah. So I, I watch nature and I see how it, endlessly handles things mm. and people think but nature's dying is it mm. <laughs> no i think um some societies might but when i look in nature i see tons of resilience yeah. what is co-regulation and what are healthy ways to learn how to co-regulate mm. co-regulation is when one body finds safety in another body so your body tells my body i'm okay i'm secure i'm safe i survived it can be a tree, it can be an animal, it can be thinking of someone you love. It's not just the body in front of you, it's any anybody mm -hmm. in your mind even, or around you, any living thing. So co-regulation is, is really how we're, we're built, it's how the body is designed to find safety and regulate. And that's why in numbers, we do much better than when we're isolated. Um, we come from that, like infants can't even regulate their own body temperature mm -hmm. without a body to touch against and kind mm -hmm. of learn from. So we develop our resilience through consistent co-regulation. And because we don't always have consistent co-regulation, we don't develop resilience. We have to redevelop it in our 
20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. That's what's amazing about the nervous system mm. is at any age you can develop that. And so when you say like healthy co-regulation, there's the, I would say there's auto-regulation and there's co-regulation. Auto-regulation is when you're in habits, it's when you're in isolation, it's when you're in addiction, even using a relationship in an addictive way. Like I'm not connecting with you, you just soothe me, right? Mm. And it's not good or bad, it's just one way we find safety temporarily and, and distance ourselves from a pain in the body. But co-regulation, like healthy co-regulation is I'm connecting with you and it brings me in connection with myself. So then when you leave, I'm not codependent, I'm not grasping on you. You're gone and I feel that connection in me and I can tend to it. Can you walk us through maybe one or two examples of ways we can co-regulate, starting with maybe a way to co-regulate nature? Mm -hmm. Nature is one of my favorite starts for people to teach this to because we have less negative overcouplings with nature mm -hmm. versus people. Mm -hmm. So if I walk up to a human, there's so, so many fears like rejection or jealousy or not being enough. But if I walk up to a tree, there's very little fear there. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tree, not, not a lot gets projected on mm -hmm. that. So what's really cool with co-regulation is if it's a living body, it will attune to your body, your body will attune to it. Mm -hmm. So the simplest way to do this is to pick something like water, it can be running water in the land, it can be out of a faucet, out of the shower. The wind is another really great one, mm -hmm. or a tree. These are bigger than us, right? This, even the water that comes into a cup, it's the body of water of the mm -hmm. earth, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you're touching this thing, when you're drinking this thing, when you're with this thing, before this thing, your body will start to feel a response to it, usually a softness. The part that's feeling the softness is the part that's co-regulating to that being. So we think of a tree laying against it, just looking at it, people watching this interview, they can just think of a tree right now mm -hmm. and you'll notice something in your body shift but your system will start to have a softened response and this tree is telling your body that right now you're safe. As I'm saying it, it sounds so ridiculous, but it's, oh, it's, it's beautiful. exactly what happens. Yeah, it's you know? beautiful. I yeah. love co-regulating to leaves just mm. moving. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just always like, I could be super stressed and I just look at like leaves fluttering and it just completely calms my nervous system. And I, I yeah. feel it, you know? See, because in that moment, the ability to even look at the leaves mm. and take them in you couldn't do that if you were in threat. No, no. So just the ability to take that in tells the body right now I'm okay. Mm. So it's so it's amazing how much happens subconsciously when we are connecting to these these co-regulators. Yeah. When you say you say our body speaks, how can we better hear and listen to it? How can we learn right. to do that more? Well, the body speaks through sensation. So the best way to understand the language of the body is through felt sense. Um, language is the mind and it can be beautiful, but the body is sensation. So when you feel a constriction, when you feel a pressure, when you feel a pleasure, when you feel a joy, those are all different ways the body's unfolding something in it mm -hmm. to show you. Pain. Pain. And, and when I say show you is I'm talking about the mind again. You know, who's the one witnessing the body, the conscious mind? So learning how to listen to the body all it means is being able to feel it. And once you practice feeling it over and over again, not just like once a week, but you know, all through the day as you sit here, like I'm noticing my back hurts. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I need to like, my body's saying, this doesn't feel good, Luis. And I was like, oh, that feels really good. Mm -hmm. The simplest thing is this does not, <laughs> it's not these huge, you know, cathedrals of pain we have to work with it can just be, how does my body feel in a chair? And that's listening to how it's speaking to you. And then you get to play with movement. And, stretching and breathing until there's pleasure and then oh i hit the pleasure my body's <laughs> happy you know i love it you know it makes me it, it reminds me of you know being a mother how i always think like my role is to let them feel their feelings but it's so much easier to like shut down feelings than let somebody feel their feelings mm -hmm. and i feel like you know, sometimes when we're young, that happens, just um, the feelings get shut off because of the environment we're in. But when we're adults, sometimes we end up shutting down our own feelings. Because mm -hmm. feeling our feelings sometimes is painful. Mm -hmm. You know, so how somebody who feels so overwhelmed with feeling their feelings, where do they even start? Mm. You start with pleasure. And I've only learned that in the last year mm. after having people start with pain for so long. Mm. Uh, because of what you just said, you know, if I think of where I was in my life being really numb and going to a room or going on Instagram or listening to something or going to a therapist, 
And they were saying, like, I want you to be with your pain. I wouldn't, that's the last thing I would want to do. Mm. But they said, I want you to be with your pleasure. You know, I think about the guitar again. Mm. Think about being in nature. It's like, start with the thing that's really easy and learn how to embody that. Learn how to deeply indulge and, and be satiated in something you love. Like the, the crunch of an apple, the taste of the tea, the breeze on your skin. That starts helping you, again, anchor you into the parts of you that can be here. And when those parts are really well defined, they act as resources for the parts that can't be here. Mm -hmm. And that's where the pain is. So then you start moving into the pain. So that, that would be my advice with that. How, how do they get there? How do they take like even the, the smallest step to kind of start feeling that safety and joy in their bodies? My favorite practice for myself and for others is just feeling the room you're in. Mm. Like truly looking at something on the wall that you like, mm. like smelling something on the breeze. What's fascinating is unless we are in our actual threat, like running, screaming, hiding for our lives, we're safe. Even then we end, we end up being safe. We survive a lot of those, mm -hmm. but we're safe. And so when you have an inability to feel joy because it feels dangerous or like you said, elusive, don't even think about feeling joy. Just think about feeling now, mm -hmm. like where are you right now? Not being mindful of the now, being sensational of the now. Mm -hmm. How does the now feel on your fingers? Just that. So it's, it's that simple and it's less of a burden of I should be joyful right now and it's more of a curiosity of what do I feel when I feel the table and then you see what emerges that's based in your reality instead of where you want to be. Yeah. I know when I first started learning this work with you, I'd even just look at some, I don't know, a little drawing or something I have up on the wall and it would just like mm -hmm. completely make, you know, make me exhale and just calm my body down because I remember how much joy that specific thing brought mm -hmm. to me when I first got it. Yeah. And yeah, I, I love that practice of attuning to the room and yes, how the room really just kind of has such a, it's such a simple practice, but it's so profound. Yeah, I love it that. Is, it is, and what's important for it is it's different for every person. Mm. Someone might be in a coffee shop, someone might be on a train, someone might be in their car, someone might be at their house. Mm. But so it's, it's all about feeling your now and noticing what emerges from it. And it's, it's so accessible. Yeah. So all you have to do is pause and feel where you are. Mm -hmm. And then the information comes in. Why do we start dissociating when we go beyond our capacity? Oh, I love talking about that. Because <laughs> I, I, do, I don't do it as much as I used to, but I do it a lot. I do it a lot. Dissociation is this really great gift from the body, because the body's saying, there's too much information flooding you. It's not going anywhere. Like you're not moving it, you're not crying it, it's not metabolizing, it just keeps building. I'm gonna give you a break from feeling this. Mm. So it literally splits itself from you. It says you're gonna leave until you have capacity or the resources or the support to feel this. So it's a very kind gesture. And it's an aesthetic as well, because when we're dissociated, we tend to be numb. We can't feel what's happening. Now, the primarily, the reason we want that is if we're literally about to be eaten by an animal, we go into play dead. So the body again kicks us out so we don't have to sit through something that horrific. So if we do survive, then we come back in and we're conscious. And if we don't, we get to transition from a blissful unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. So dissociation is like an incredibly benevolent force. Like a protector. It's a protector and an easer and like a gentler. But when we are stuck in it, when we're living in it day to day, like because the amount of emails overwhelm me because of the last 10 years of my life, right? Not just one day of emails. Then I'm dissociating as I'm walking through my day. I'm not feeling the food or tasting it that I'm eating. I'm not feeling the person in front of me. I'm not noticing my body. I'm just slightly outside of it and the body's taking over, mm -hmm. but I'm not really connected here. And that's when you see just people in lots of numbness and with symptoms that they've had for a long time, but weren't able to feel them. Um, it's seeing dissociation as that gift helps us not feel so much shame about it. Mm. Like even when I'm talking in an interview or in, or in a class or in front of a bunch of people and I lose my train of thought, or I zone out for a moment, I'm like, another s signal, the body's saying too much. Yeah, and so I take a breath or I press my hands into my legs or I say, oh, you tell me something. I listen to the other person for a little bit and then I come back into my body. Mm. So it's not something like to avoid, it's something to listen to and respond to. Mm. You say trauma healing is constant pendulation. Mm. What does that mean? 
And how does one practice pendulation? Oh, pendulation, that's the practice that really changed my life somatically. Like a lot, a lot of situations changed my life. Mm -hmm. That was the practice. Mm -hmm. Because it teaches you first the notion, the, the reality, that there are so many different states inside of you. You are not just anxious. You are not just happy. There are so many different parts. I can have anxiety in my belly and like total joy in my chest. Mm -hmm. So pendulation invites a curiosity to notice, well, where do you feel two different contradictory states, first of all? And then when you find them, you get to be the facilitator. You get to swing between them. You don't have to live in the anxiety. You don't have to bypass the anxiety just for the joy. You get to dip into both. Mm -hmm. As you dip into both these like walls of exile that happen with these states, they start coming down and they start to come together. Mm -hmm. And this inner alchemy occurs where you're not just, again, in your joy or just in your pain, mm -hmm. but they, they, they soften each other. They inform each other and something new comes out of it. Mm -hmm. So if we understand that as an inner pendulation, outer pendulation when it comes to trauma healing would be, um, let's say I'm afraid of people because of a traumatic past with people. So avoidance of people is not pendulation. That's me just sitting in the isolation. Forcing myself to be around people all the time is not pendulation. That's forcing something mm -hmm. that doesn't feel good. Swinging between the two. Right now, I need to tend to my capacity of overwhelm by sitting in my room for two mm -hmm. hours and doing whatever I want. Oh, okay, I feel that. Now I'm going to go out and touch into society, socializing people until I hit my lid, mm -hmm. and then I go back. So it's a swing between the two to build a resilient nervous system, not ignoring one or the other or avoiding one or the other. Mm -hmm. And that's part of your wisdom you're saying, you know, with your children or people you love. From saving someone from their stress, they're not learning how to pendulate mm -hmm. from stress to pleasure. They're learning how to have someone distract them mm -hmm. from stress and give them pleasure right away, right? As a distraction rather than like an internal ecology that's shifting because you're able to be with both. Yeah. Maybe give me an example about like with kids, for example, like how we can build up their resilient nervous system. Mm, we do it by building ours <laughs> in response to them. So if I see um, my daughter being really angry or sad or upset about something that let's say someone said to her at school, what's happening in my body? Mm. <laughs> yeah, right. So when I feel that like, you know, that horror, again, it's trigger, mm. what is that reminding my body of from of my childhood? Youth, yeah. I have a lot of yeah. <laughs> reminders, I'm sure you do. Yeah. That That's the work. And it's the worst answer because <laughs> I would love to say, this is how you build your kids resilience. And a lot of people will, and they might be right. For me, it's, it's us because children are looking to us as the co-regulator, looking to us to decide what's safe and what isn't. So if they're in distress and then we're meeting them with our distress, there's nothing for them to pendulate to. Mm. Children, you know, the body pendulates naturally. That's the first thing to understand. We can simulate it, we can like invite it, we can stimulate it, but it does it on its own. So if she's in her pain, you know, her trauma relationally, and I'm in my bliss and I'm witnessing her, she's eventually gonna swing over to here. Mm. So she just pendulated herself. So that's my favorite way with kids. I, love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get to practice it every day. <laughs> I totally I mean a million times a day too. <laughs> a million times a day. Why are boundaries so important in healing on the healing journey? Wow, I mean, because they come from the body. You know, they, they, boundaries, the way I teach them, the way I experience them is my body's telling me a no or a yes, and then I communicate it for my body, mm. whether it's like that, whether it's like that, whether it's like, nah, it's, you know, there's always different ways we'll say if we're liking something or if we're not. And why it's important is when I express a boundary, again, a joyful one or a painful one, whatever it is, a yes or a no, I'm tending to capacity. Mm. That's all a boundary is. Boundary is just the body saying I'm at capacity. So if someone says something that offends me, I'm at capacity. I, I, even if I don't like it on a good day, at that moment, if it overwhelms me, something in my body is saying no. Mm. And I say, I don't want to talk that way right now. Or can you give me some space? And then they do. And then I feel a settling. Mm. So boundaries are another way we tend to that, that inner place that's saying, I don't have any more capacity for this. Let me give it a little space. Yeah. How do we transform trauma into vitality? Oh, I, can I actually ask you a question? Yes. Um, what, how have you experienced trauma in your body being vitality, if you, if you have? I'm curious, like, what does that mean to you? Like when I think about trauma that's happened, 
I think my body kind of constricts, mm -hmm. but then when it transformed to vitality, it could be like as easy as just putting on a piece of music mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know, there's a shift, there's an energetic shift that happens and I can remember mm -hmm. that I am not my trauma mm -hmm. and that I can, I have joy inside my body and I am a joyous person and it kind of transforms, you know, mm -hmm. especially when I'm feeling like, constricted or stressed or anything like that. Music is a big one. Music and dance, I'd say, are the two for me, where I just can, you know, it can move me out of anything. Mm, that's an excellent way to describe that, because when I'm hearing you saying it transforms, the, the it that's transforming is really the body's relationship to the energy, right? Mm. So if it's a traumatic or even a stressful situation or a painful situation, there's all this energy building up. But the only way it can build up is if there's constriction in response to it, right? Mm -hmm. So my body's response to the energy is this, it presses against it. And then we have this, ooh, this horrible feeling. When it becomes vitality, it's just like you said, it's, it stops doing this and starts doing this. Mm -hmm. And when the energy moves, it feels so pleasant. Mm -hmm. Like that's what pleasure is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I've learned that even, that I can almost have both at the same time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That even when, traumatic things are happening, I could still feel vitality and joy. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that comes from the pendulation practice because yeah. you've learned that there's these different states in you. Yeah. And I, I've really gotten such a clarity around how trauma is just life force. It's mm -hmm. just way too much life force mm -hmm. because the, the whole purpose of, of having a trauma response is you need to, or I should say the mechanics of it, is you need all this energy and adrenaline, like propelling force to get you out of threat. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of energy. Survival, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so survival response is like huge, like godly amounts of energy. And when that's stuck in you because the body's constricted, you have so much life force, so much living energy in you that it hurts. Just like with grief, you have so much love that it hurts. Mm -hmm. So I think when that starts to move because the body's opening, it leaves my chest for my arms. Maybe my arms do this. It leaves, it leaves my chest for my face and I cry, mm. I laugh, right? Mm. I make a song, I paint something. So that, that transformation of the, the trauma into the vitality is really something that was stored that's really potent has now been liberated. Yeah. So it's the same energy, it's just what the body's doing with it. Yeah, and sometimes it just takes that reminder of like, I don't have to just be in the pain or be in the suffering or be in the grief, you mm -hmm. know? That's exactly right. Yeah. Hmm. You recently sent out a practice on how to stay in your body while witnessing terror. And it moved me so mm. much to, um, to go through that. Would you mind leading us through that practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think of something, um, whether you want to share it or not, is up to you, that you've seen on the news that was horrific. I mean, what's happening in Palestine and Israel. Perfect. Right. And I'm sure that has roots for you, too. Mm. So when you think of seeing that right now, where do you feel that in your body? My throat. What happens? Constriction. Mm -hmm. So let's just notice mm -hmm. my body responds to what I'm seeing with constriction. And as you're feeling that, where, what part of you can feel where you are right now? My fingers. What do they feel? They feel like they're on the table. Yeah, let's just see what that feels like. Maybe mm -hmm. you start smiling as soon as you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're playing an instrument. <laughs> yeah, it feels nice. And let's just hold both. Let's notice that that's happening in response to the imagery. imagery. And then here's this table. And you just tell me what happens in your body as we sit with both. Starts to open. Let's follow it, see what happens next. That reminds me to breathe. Mm -hmm. Even that, it reminds me to breathe. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about somatic empathy is when we see something, mm -hmm. the body responds like it's there, right? So what we tend to do tend to do is we either stay oriented toward that thing because it's so terrifying to the body it wants to orient the threat it wants to keep it in its sight like you would if there was a snake in the room right you want to know where it was so that's what we do with the media and with news and even social media with these situations that occur so that's one way 
In other ways, we completely avoid it because mm. we don't want to feel the pain. We don't want to know what's going on. We can't handle it. Some bodies just can't even handle it, right? It will, it will throw them off. Then what we just did is this middle place. It's this body alchemy. It's this the bones of the somatic work, the way I teach it, is bring it all together like a big compost heap. Mm. And you get to honor that a place in you constricts and gets scared and grieves and anger. All these things that come up when you take this in. And you honor the reality of where am I in the room? And that does that thing you just talked about, trauma and vitality. It takes your your breath was taken away from your body mm. when you're watching those images. And then your breath is given back to your body mm. when you feel the table. And everyone can take what they want from that. What I take from that, based on being a big body listener, is what gives me back my breath is my survival. Mm. And it's it's the way I honor things in life. It's the way I honor life itself. So if I'm sitting in my beautiful home, safe, and my breath is taken from me in solidarity with someone's pain, that doesn't feel like a good way to honor them or my privilege of having safety. But to deeply experience my safety, not just know it, but feel it in my bones, and from those safe bones, like witness someone's horror, I have such a deep felt sense of, of their experience without losing mine. Mm. So I honor myself, I honor them, and then I don't go in the world one more unconscious, angry, scared person. And I prefer to do that, to prevent that happening to me more than trying to save someone else. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. What does it feel like right now? As I say all that back to you after you're feeling that in your body. It feels like I'm breathing. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. So it's controversial because um, I, because of codependent cycles, we've really conflated, like, I have to feel what you're going through. I have mm -hmm. to suffer with you in order to be compassionate or to help you. And if we just think of the most obvious thing, like if I fell off this chair right now, if you just fell off the chair with me, like, what help would you be to mm -hmm. me? You know, so there's this beauty of resourcing yourself based on your reality. I'm not talking about bypassing, but where you actually are in the moment. From there, how do you live in the world? And I think there's some mystery that comes through there. The way you leave this building, when you have your breath, and how you look people in the eyes, and the food decisions you make. I mean, so many things mm. change the world just from being in your own safe body, yeah. instead of leaving it for someone else's experience. Yeah. It's a, it's a total practice. It's a daily practice. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about that you feel we didn't really cover? I don't know. <laughs> I think I want to ask you a question. Yes. It's the interviewer. <laughs> yeah. I just want to know, because I heard you say several times, it's a daily practice. Like, mm -hmm. wh what has this been like for you? Like, what... How has your daily practice changed by being in relationship with your body? What does that look like? What does that feel like? Well, awareness, even being aware that I do certain things in certain ways mm -hmm. um, that are coming from a trauma response, being aware, um, like instead of going to a glass of wine, mm -hmm. lying on, a, on the floor and breathing, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like just making healthier choices when I feel something activate in my body. I mean, in so many ways, I mean, whether it's through the foods I eat, whether it's through how I am with my kids, you know, and they're, all three of them are having a meltdown at bedtime mm -hmm. saying, mama's gonna go to her room and she's gonna calm her body down. And when my body's calm, I'll come back and we'll read a story. And I go, and I take as much time as I need, yeah. and I breathe, and I calm my nervous system down, and I come back, and I'm like, let's read a book. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's the daily practice. It's mm -hmm. like, in big and small ways, uh, knowing that I'm activated, knowing that something has kind of, something's bringing up something in me, mm -hmm. um, that I just need to like process and move through my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because yeah. it's the, it's the, I don't know if simple is the right word, I'm going to say simple, but it's, it's like the commonness of it. Mm. Like, there's my child having a meltdown, I go to my room for a moment, I go back, 
you know, it's just it's as simple as that. Yeah. You don't have to go on a retreat for a week. <laughs> you don't have to spend tons of <laughs> money. Yeah. You know, it's like super simple. It's like, what are my shoulders doing while I drive to work? Mm. I think just ending on that note for people just to remember how simple these are in daily applications. Yeah. How am I breathing when I'm watching the TV? Like the simplest questions. If we make those habits, the nervous system starts to really transform and so does our relationship to our bodies. Yeah, like you're driving a car and you're in traffic. Put the, put on a piece of music that makes you feel better, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> even when you say that, it's like these are just ways to make life more pleasurable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we all have come from a womb. Mm -hmm. And the experience of being in the womb, there's something very uh, rhythmic and soothing. We're in a body of water. We're just moving. Um, we're kind of being soothed, right? Mm -hmm. Like constantly. How does the memory of that help us um, heal in our everyday life? Yeah, so when you say that, I think I think of memory through the somatic lens, which mm -hmm. is like how do in we recreate body. those feelings, mm -hmm. right? Like what, what sensations bring us back to that? And what's, what's beautiful about that imagery of us being in a womb, um, I was having this like joke and you were saying we all came from a womb. I was going to say speak for yourself, but then I didn't. But, <laughs> but I definitely came from a womb. But it, so in, in the, <laughs> what's really cool about the womb is it's super warm, right? And every inch of the body is being touched. Mm. Right? So every inch is being touched with fluid and with warmth. There's vibration and there's sound. And your all your needs are met, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this, you're literally every second being told that you're safe, you're okay. I do this practice, you did it actually with us, where a bunch of people will get on a massage table, yeah. they'll each take a minute and they'll ask for what they want, like what kind of touch they want or what they're holding. And so many times I'll see people in their 70s and 80s getting on the table, going to the fetal position and just being asked to be held. Mm. And that's exactly what's happening there. They're being held, there's pressure, there's um, sound, warmth, there's sound. warmth, vibration. There's a containment on the body that tells the body there's something bigger than you, mm -hmm. outside of you, that's holding you. And this is why the co-regulation with nature is so powerful. And I think why the Earth Mother archetype exists. Mm -hmm. Because just like when you're in that little womb, the same thing's happening, there's this bigger body outside that womb that's holding you. When I lay on a mountain, when I lay, when I walk through a parking lot, when I look up at the sky, there's this bigger body that, that mm -hmm. has me. So it's, I think what it really comes down to is the reminder that something bigger can handle you. And when the body can feel that, and there's so many ways we, we kind of prompt that, the body immediately starts to downregulate. Mm -hmm. And in that still can be a huge expression of emotion. When we're talking about regulation, it doesn't always look like, oh, I feel so peaceful. Mm -hmm. You can go into extreme sobbing. You can go to extreme laughter. Your body heat can just rise suddenly. Mm -hmm. You can like hyperventilate for a second and then your breath comes in. There's a lot of different ways that the body, the human animal, you know, will find its its safety and regulate its its body and its nervous system. But I find recreating that sensational awareness that something bigger can handle me is really what helps settle a lot of that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, through all your, you know, you, you've, at this point, I mean, there's so many people mm -hmm. who pass through, whether your membership or your course. Are there themes or things that always kind of patterns or themes that you see that we all, that kind of connects us all? Yeah, I think the one I see, regardless of what country someone's from or what happened to them or any anything, is just this fear they don't belong. Mm -hmm. it, it just, every single person has some way of saying it, and it might be a little different, but it all comes back to this, okay, this thing happened in my life, and from that moment, the story was created where I don't belong. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways that shows itself. Like, I can't say how I really feel or I won't belong. Mm -hmm. I look different, so I don't belong. Something's wrong with my sexuality, I don't belong. There's so many ways, but uh, that I think that core, when we talk about core wounds and such, mm -hmm. we're really talking about a moment in time where something happened and what it meant was you didn't belong. And not belonging to the human animal is the most terrifying thing because mm -hmm. we need each other to actually survive. Mm -hmm. It's not even a sense of belonging like out of joy and like emotional connection. It's belonging to so I can eat tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? So if, if something happens where I don't think I belong anymore, that gets overcoupled with 
threat, life threat, like deep cellular memories of past. I'm going to die. That's right. So the, the I don't belong over coupled with I'm going to die, I think is the most powerful thing that I see. And it's the most powerful thing in most people's bodies. Because when they feel they belong, what's really the problem? I mean, there's not much of a problem. Your, your joy belongs, your rage belongs, your ugly belongs, your beauty belongs, it, it all belongs. There's no part of you you have to kind of contrive or perform. It's just allowed to exist and there's a great security there. And it goes back to the womb. Mm. Like when you're being nourished and fed and rocked in there, you so belong to that space, there's no question about it. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I love you, Louise. <laughs> I love you Thank too. you. Thank you, love. <laughs> If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.